Hi, today we're going to discuss the next learning theory, which is information processing theory. Um, so let's get started today. As you can see, learning information processing theory is going to be a really big change from the other things that we've done so far in class. Um, it's really going to look at the brain and learning from a neuropsych perspective. So we're really going to be thinking about um, the brain as a computer and the components of the brain as a component of learning. So we're really going to be thinking today about the constructs and how those constructs um, relate to each other. So let's look at the information processing view of learning. Um, it's really inspired by the computer, so we're going to be using that as a metaphor for the learning today in cognition and memory. Um, so memory processor is the metaphor, using as a multi-store storage model of memory, so thinking about memory in different ways. So we think about short-term and long-term memory and how that affects or how that could be seen as um, in view of learning. So the sensory register, working memory, and long-term memory. So let's go through the whole model and then we'll talk about the specific parts. So in the world, we have all this information, right? Out there in the world, information. And that's external to us. And then we have our internal processing, right? That's us. We get input all the time from lots and lots of sources. And it goes into our sensory register that logs all of our input. That's like our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our, our hands, all, everything that we, all of our receptors. And we perceive and attend to some of that at any given time. And that goes into our working memory. That's what we're thinking about. So right now you're using your ears to hear me and you're attending to what you're hearing, right? And there's only a limited amount of space in our working memory. So what I'm saying right now is in your working memory. And to keep it there, we have to rehearse it, but over time there's interference and it decays. We don't hold things in our working memory indefinitely. So in order to keep memories, we have to encode it into our long-term memory, which is a relatively permanent storage of memory that's not um, knowledge, um, procedural, declarative, and conditional knowledge, um, and memory, semantic, procedural, and episodic. Then there's also interference and decay in our long-term memory. Um, if we don't use it, we lose it, so to speak. Um, and then if we want to get that back out of our long-term memory, we retrieve it back to our working memory, which leads us to a response generator like our mouth speaking. So I, if I asked you what is the first part of the information processing model, you would have to go back to your long-term memory and retrieve that and use your mouth as a response generator to speak the word sensory register for our output. And all of this is guided by our executive control processes, which we call metacognition, that plan and run each step of our information processing. When we have disorders of executive control, things like ADHD or autism, that's when we see dysfunctions in this whole process. So let's take this a little bit deeper and remember we have all of this. In our sensory register, the purpose is to briefly hold stimuli from our environment until it can be fully processed. It's very large. We're constantly getting information in our sensory register that's very limited. So only one to three seconds do we really, are we really keeping that. Um, it resembles our original stimulus. So whatever we're getting that information from, that's what our sensors, sensory register keeps. Um, echoic memory is sound, iconic memory is vision. Um, that's, the, that's the content of our sensory register. And think about all of the different sensory registers you're getting right now, right? You might be sitting on something soft, so you're feeling that with your skin. You might be hearing not just my voice, but the air conditioning blowing, or maybe the dishwasher in the background, or maybe you're on campus and you hear other people's conversations and, um, in the table next to you. Um, you might be um, feeling the cold air, you might be smelling someone's lunch, you might be um, seeing um, all of the people around you or the PowerPoint that you're supposed to be watching or the things in the background, right? So there's lots of sensory register that's coming into you all of the time, right? Um, but and that leads to our working memory. Um, whoa, whoa, ah, go back. Um, and that's we're perceiving all of this. Um, and our perception is aided by pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is what we call um, in our gestalt 
psychology, our human tendency to organize information by patterns. So to help us recognize things more quickly and easily, we, um, we recognize patterns. Um, and there's quite a few different kinds of patterns that we can recognize and um, part of the stop. So um, figure around relationships. So in that first picture, you can see um, we can, do you see a vase or do you see um, faces? And we very quickly usually can discover or differentiate between what's in the thick, what's in the foreground and what's in the background of a picture. And that is something that we very easily recognize. Um, like in this one, we very easily see three groups of lines because of proximity. So we group these quickly because of proximity. This helps us, right? Um, as opposed to that group where we, we have a harder time distinguishing how many lines we have, right? Um, similarity, um, we see lines as similar that are in similar shape um, and that helps us distinguish. Um, and we can see here the proximity outweighs the similarity. Um, common direction, um, we see this as a continuous line even though it's not um, lines going up and down, right? Um, we see this as two shapes rather than um, five separate shapes because of um, we are some simplicity sake break this down um, more easily, right? And we perceive this as a circle rather than down lines for closure. So you can see how our brains automatically make a closure here rather than just a series of dotted lines. This helps us perceive things more easily. Right? It helps us make sense of our environment quickly um, because of this pattern recognition. And we can take advantage of these pattern recognitions in our memory, right? So um, that's prior knowledge. Um, and attention is the process of focusing on stimuli. So how do we attend to things? Um, it's influenced by our prior knowledge. So we paid attention to things that we already know about. Um, we pay attention to things about what we need to know. So if we, um, if we know that we need to know something or that something's called attention to ourselves because we need it, we pay attention to it more often. Um, because of context, so depending on where we are, right? Um, tax, task complexity. So when things are right in that zone, right, we pay more attention to it. So um, Vygotsky would have called that zone of proximal development, right? And um, things that are neither too difficult or too hard, um, we attend to more easily. And also by our ability to control and focus, our self-regulation, right? And we know that some people have disorders of this attention, attentional. Um, complexity. Um, people with ADHD or ADD have difficulty with this attentional process, and so they have more difficulty attending to things. And that's, a, again, a difficulty with executive functioning. Um, which leads us to working memory. Working memory is a storage and workspace for our thoughts information um, that's currently in use. So working memory is um, relatively small. It's around seven new items at once, um, plus or minus two, depending on, peop depending on your own personal individuality. Um, it lasts between 5 to 20 seconds for new information, although you can make that longer by rehearsing. Um, it can be images, meaning-based information, language-based, it can be nonverbal or spatial, it can be visual. So lots of different things can constitute our working memory. So let's practice working memory. So I'm going to show you something and I want you to memorize it. Okay, so memorize this. Okay, say it back. It was difficult, right? Let's try the next one. Okay, I'll say that one back. Okay, how about this one? Okay, say that one back. Finally. Okay, which one was easier? Right, the last one was easier, even though it was longer. It had more things to it. And the, sh the shortest one was actually the hardest. But why? Um, because we, we could, it wasn't really new information. And all that last one, it acted just as one piece of information, right? It was just, Mary had a little lamb, and we stored that as one piece of information. Whereas the first one, all those different letters, each of those letters was a separate piece because we couldn't chunk it together. Um, so um, it must be kept activated to be retained. 
So we have to keep it working with it or, or we don't keep it in our working memory. We forget it. Um, we rehearse it. We repeat the information. So when you were trying to remember those letters, what did you do? Did you just say them over and over again to yourself to, to rehearse them, to repeat them in your head? Exactly. Um, maintenance and elaborative is, is connecting it to something you already knew. So perhaps maybe a better strategy for remembering those letters would have been to create a sentence out of the letters and then and then connecting it to something you already knew um you would have you would have learned it and that's almost what we did with mary had a little lamb right we already knew the poem so it was easy for us to keep track of it right i'm chunking is grouping it into meaningful units and, and we did that when we kept that entire poem together right and automata automaticity automaticity is um, when we when we already have it down right so if I say two plus two you don't even have to think about it you know that's four right it's, it's it becomes automatic to us and dual processing um, is is using two things together so when you see something and it automatically triggers and you um, you process it together so we sometimes try to get that to work by perhaps singing a song to help us remember something visual or picturing a picturing an image to help us remember some words, right? Um, or maybe even smelling um, a certain scent to help us remember um, something that we're studying. Okay, so all tricks to help us remember and then we want to encode that to our long-term memory. And our long-term memory holds information that's well learned. Um, it's practically unlimited. Um, and dura capacity and duration is practically unlimited, um, but the trick is the retrieval. So how do we get things from our long-term memory back so we can get them? And that requires time and effort. And it depends on our organization. So there's some debate in the field about whether you actually forget things or you're just unable to retrieve things. And maybe that's a semantic difference, right? Um, but it really depends on how we organize that knowledge and how we represented it. So perhaps I, I can remember things that are just hidden in some part of my brain that I just cannot access anymore. Um, and the contents um, are both verbal and visual, knowledge and memory. Um, so um, the forms of knowledge are declarative. So knowing that specific things, um, explanations, facts, definitions, right? That's kind of what we think of. Um, procedural memory is knowing how to do something, um, knowing how to jump rope, how to ride a bike, how to solve two digit equations, um, et cetera. And then conditional knowledge is knowing when and how to apply your knowledge. So that's um, knowing when I should use the quadratic formula, perhaps. And then there's types of memory. Um, semantic memory is memory of meaning and memory of declarative knowledge. So knowing that you know something. Um, procedural memory is um, memory of how to do things. So remembering um, how to ride a bike or memory of, of habits and skills and actions of appropriate procedures. So remembering that you've done this before. And then episodic memory is tied to a, a particular time and place or events that we've experienced. That's what we typically think of as memories. So those types of memories that we have that we, um, we can think back of. Oh, I remember last Christmas. I remember when my grandmother um, you know, took me to the movies, those kinds of memories. I'm representing declarative and semantic memories. Um, so we have um, propositions and propositional networks. So these are sets of connections and relationships in which models of knowledge are held. And that's a lot like those concept maps we talked about, how, we, how we've interconnected these relationships and these concepts together. Um, we have um, images, and these are the appearances of physical attributes. Um, and then complex knowledge is the schema, this abstract structure that represents an understanding of an object or a set of relationships. So how we, um, how we understand this complexity, the schema about complex things. And this is also steered, stored in our declarative knowledge and our semantic memories. Um, story grammar, scripts. So when they say story grammar, that means knowing that the, how a story is set up, a beginning, a middle of an end, and it's really complex, right? That, and this is something innate that we, we know, we all understand how stories go. Um, and it's a complex knowledge, our schema around how a story ends. So I really want you to think about how sensory register, working memory, long-term memory all relate to each other and contribute to our input and output and how this affects our learning and um, how these constructs relate to each other. When you think of information processing theory, you should really be thinking about this computer model of the brain and how it constructs memory um, through this 
availability of resources and retrieval and encoding of our memories. Um, so if you have any questions, as always, feel free to call or send me an email and we can set up a time to chat. Thanks. Bye.